Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the auditorium at Calvary Road Baptist Church in the People's Republic of California, the gulag known as Los Angeles County, the little burg known as Monrovia. Nice to have you here. And my goodness, what a beautiful day in Southern California it was today. Uh, let me just recount. I feel a little bit blurry because this last month for me has, let's see, uh, August 5th, I left here, was in Nepal for two weeks, uh, then came back and was here for a couple of weeks, and then the pastor's retreat up in Northern California, which ended uh, last Saturday, and uh, before the retreat, we had Ibrahim and Gosha, uh, and they communicated with us their love and uh, best wishes to you all. They have safely arrived in Londonistan. And, um, and, uh, and then I had uh, uh, Samuel Rye, uh, both before the retreat, and then I drove him down here with me when I came back from the retreat on Saturday. I'm telling you, I was absolutely dragging and uh, I'm so thankful that he preached for us Wednesday night. It was a wonderful message. And then we had the special meeting on Monday night. Um, and uh, insightful, I'm telling you. Um, I asked him to basically speak about uh, reaching your grown children. But he spent the first 45 minutes basically telling dads how to raise children from toddlers all the way up. And it was, that has been a strong suit of my ministry for 45 years. And I felt like a kindergartner uh, with the insights that he was sharing. And, uh, and uh, boy, I tell you what, it just, as I was sitting there, he said, I said, I was thinking to myself, he's not, he's not talking at all about what I asked him to talk about. You know, he did eventually, but while he was getting there, uh, I thought it's just an example how it's just not wise to forego the means of grace because you have no idea what you're going to miss that you may never, ever in this lifetime ever be able to regain. And uh, so um, it, the, the end game was, was dads of grown children. And, uh, but, but for the first probably 35, 40 minutes, it was dads raising, raising their little boys and their little girls. And some of the insights that this guy has is just absolutely mind-boggling. And, um, and then the next day, um, I, I spent, I spent some time with him on, uh, on, on Tuesday, yesterday, I took him to the, uh, to the Nixon library because I wanted to show him the life-size statue of Chairman Mao. Cause after all, he was a Maoist and, um, and we had a very interesting discussion. And on the way down, he, t he mentioned two things that I thought was so absolutely and utterly practical, um, and uh, I thought, well, it's, I, it's, it's a shame that I'm the only one here. And I guess I'm going to have to repeat what he said. But uh, he pointed out that one of the ways that you make sure that children, that their mind lights on the Lord Jesus every day, and, and you want your children's mind to settle on the Lord Jesus Christ every single day, every single day and the way you achieve that is not by bullying not by drilling not by pushing no you, you just they just know that around you once a day you're going to ask them a question tell me something about the lord jesus christ from the bible so anything tell me anything well he was born of a virgin okay great thanks and the next day you ask him a question they always born of a virgin no you told me that yesterday something else and, and after a while, they get to the place where in their mind, they'll be thinking about him because they're anticipating the question. And, and, and their mind is on the Lord. 
And I thought, my goodness, uh, that is that is insightful. That's tremendous wisdom. And uh, and then he we were talking on and talk about how how, how hard headed teenage boys are. And he pointed out, he says, well, you know, teenage boys, they know everything. Teenage boys know everything. I said, so let me ask you a question. How do you deal with an adolescent or anybody else that knows everything? He said, you ask them what they know. Just ask them. Say, you know everything. Tell me. What? Tell me about this. And then let them speak. And you're ready to, ready to listen. They're, they, they're not used to people listening. And they will come to appreciate or rue the day uh, that you started listening to them because they have to, they, they claim they know everything. They got to put up or shut up. And when they tell you what they think they know, they need to expect from you what's reasonable, rational, and responsible is for you to be able to respond. So, well, if that's true, then what about this? And so you, and he, and he says it just is a virtually infallible way to interact with a know-it-all teenager. So I'm going to start using that on you, Joshua, from now on, okay? So just want you to know, he, but he, he doesn't act like he knows it all. He may know it all, but he doesn't act like he knows it all. So I, I, was, just, I was just rehearsing in my mind um, before before we um, turned the camera on, how wonderfully blessed we are as a church, and I handed him off today to a pastor, and and came to just an offhanded remark. I asked how so and so doing, and he kind of. Mm. I said, "Oh, well, probably, yeah, not a problem with him, but a, but a problem with his ministry." is this pastor has succeeded another pastor who died. And, um, and there's difficulties and challenges. And the, the heartbreak is the widow has thrashed and trashed her dead husband's ministry, his pastorate that she basically ran off about a third of the congregation that were members of the church when her husband died. And so I asked the pastor, I said, excuse me, I didn't know him well enough, the guy who died, I didn't know him well enough, but I said, did, did, he, have a, did he have an issue with a wife who was just out of control? And he kind of he didn't say anything. And so I turned to him because I know I know his wife, and of course I, we we all know Samuel Rye's wife. And I said, you know, I I I honestly believe. I honestly believe that uh, the husband and wife thing is the single greatest problem in churches in the United States today. It's the single greatest problem, particularly with pastors. Almost every pastor that I know, I mean, the great majority, not all, certainly, but the great majority of pastors that I know, they have wives that are absolutely out of control. Their wives do more harm to them and their ministry than any other person who is bent on the destruction of the congregation. Why so? Because she's not submissive and because she's mouthy. Now, let me share something with you, because this, this is a big problem, and I, and I think it's, um, I, I, know, I know a pastor who basically lets everybody know, yeah, you can't say anything of my, uh, you, if I say something of mine, boy, boy, so is she, she's just not going to put up with that. What? So this is a guy who's afraid of his wife, that if he says or does something that he thinks she won't like, she's going to vocally, publicly retaliate against him in front of other people. Folks, that's just not right. That's, that's not right. Don't get me wrong. I, 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 think, I think a wife should be profoundly influential in her husband's life and ministry. Profoundly. 
But to take him to task in front of other people, to show discourtesy, disrespect, and dishonor in front of other people, my goodness, how many verses in Proverbs did Solomon devote to that kind of a woman? Better to be better to be live in the corner of the rooftop than, than to have that kind of a wife. And, you, and, yet, and yet you have it in so many pastors, in so many congregations. At my first pastorate, there was a woman who basically let everybody know on a fairly regular basis, you don't mess with me. You mess with me, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. I promise that if you mess with me, I'll get you. I'll get you. No matter what happens, I'll get you. And she had, she was married and had two sons. And the three men in her family were absolutely and utterly terrified of her. They were scared to death of her. And I think that's a problem. Now, please understand, I'm, I'm not interested in a husband being a dictator. Every husband married to every woman needs to recognize that his relationship with her is based on its volunteerism. He, he, is, he, is, he voluntarily opts for God's plan for his life to provide leadership in his home, and she voluntarily opts for God's plan for her life to submit to him in the home. And so he's got no business to even try to act like a dictator because he doesn't have any right to dictate whether or not she serves God or how she serves God. His responsibility is to provide leadership. Her responsibility is to follow. So much so that some people so misunderstand what the Bible teaches about husband and wife relation. Let, let me give you an example. Let's say a guy decides to stay home from church. He said, I don't want to go to church. Fine. Then the wife goes to church. She doesn't stay home because he stays home. No wife stays home from church because her husband decides to stay home from church. That's just crazy. That's, it's not submission to stay home from church because your husband is too much of a doofus to know that he ought to be in church. That's not submission. That's rebellion against the will of God for your life. It's not failure to submit to him. It's failure to submit to God. And so I'm not interested in any husband being a dictator. I'm not interested in any husband trying to act like a bot. You know, you need to do what I say because I'm not. No, please, get, it, get over yourself. Get over yourself. But, but neither am, am I persuaded that God's plan is for any wife to be a doormat to anybody. And you say, well, what am I supposed to do? Just keep my mouth shut and say nothing? I think you ought to choose where you interact with him. And if you're going to disagree with him, and you want to disagree with him strongly, and you want to disagree with him forcefully, then disagree with him privately, just not in front of other people. Not in front of other people. Oh, my goodness, we've got husbands all across the, all across the country that have no idea how to be a husband, have no idea how to be a dad. We've got wives that have no idea how to be a wife and have no idea how to be a mother. And I just want you to know that today at lunchtime, I just got full of it. I was so sick and tired of hearing that sad song played out again and again and again and again. Um, and Rodney King was not a Christian, but he did say something right in his life. Can't we all just get along? And the way for husbands and wives to get along is for the husband to be the guy God wants him to be, which means you ought to be the one taking your family to church. And if you do not, you are wrong, W-R-O-N-G. You're weak-willed, excuse me, you're a pathetic excuse for a man if you're not a spiritual leader to your family, because that's what God wants from men, okay, and, to, and, and who are married and who are husbands. And, and a wife, she ought to choose what, what is best for her in the plan and purpose of God for her life. And what is best for her is to be the partner who complements the man who has been called to be the leader in the home. If you don't want to follow him, honey, don't marry him. Amen. If you don't want to lead her, buddy, don't marry her. Amen. I guess we should probably pray now, huh?
Did I get that off my did I get that off my chest okay? So glad to have you here. Father, thank you for your goodness, the opportunity that we have to be here for a study of your word. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have to approach the throne of grace uh, to find mercy and help in time of need. And Lord, you know that we are always, always in need. And so we pray that you might help us to avail ourselves of the means of grace. I pray that you might work in the lives of those who, despite wanting to be and claiming to pretend to be loving parents, will deny their children access to the means of grace. They will not take their children to church Sunday mornings. They will not take their children to church Sunday night. They will not take their, church, their children to church on Wednesday night. And children simply have only the access that their parents provide. Dear Lord, help us as a country, help us as a congregation and as couples to not deny our children access to the means of grace years before they become aware of the benefit to them and their need for access to the means of grace. We pray for Thomas, we pray for Jackie, we pray for Socorro and Ruby and Olga and Chuck and Dan and Donna and Linda Fay. We pray for Dini and Corky, we pray for Coach, for uh, Joe Jackowitz, um, as he faces more physical struggles as, a relate to, as it relates to this uh, Camp Lejeune issue for ex-Marines. And we pray for the Beer family suffering the loss of John Beer, our friend. We pray for other sick loved ones. We pray for our Through the Bible reading program and for our discipleship ministry. Uh, help us to be in relationships with someone to mentor us and someone who will allow us to mentor them. It's so good for everyone involved. It is such a blessing to the Christian life. Help us to, uh, to hunger and have an appetite for the best that you have, not contenting ourselves to just getting by. And for that, we thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to turn in your Bible, if you would please, to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. As you're turning there, let me just read, oh, we have so many blessings. The opportunity that we had as a congregation to serve God with Dolly Spicer, the privilege that God gave to Brian to be her husband. Brian has written a card to uh, for him and his family to us. We want to say thank you for all your love and support during this difficult time. We love our church family, and of course, the church family loves, loves Brian and loves Dolly. And then I also got this from Eugene and Olga Kozachenko. Dear Brother John, as I write this note, you... He said, I charter the international skies and lands, something I always appreciated about you. I guess he wrote this while I was on my way to Nepal. Missionary, mission-mindedness and dedication. We pray your Nepal outreach would be fruitful and your Greece time beneficial. Olga and I wanted to thank you for involving us in the church ministry here with the ladies retreat and church service. We hope and pray we were the same blessing to you and all as y'all, y'all. He's, he's a Ukrainian that speaks with a Southern English accent. Y'all were to us. Special thanks for a generous money love offering. Thank you for nearly 20 years of your friendship and support. And now with Nikita too. And we look forward to however many more years in the ministry together God may give us. We pray for you and ask God to bless you and us with you, with love and appreciation, your ambassadors, Eugene and Olga. That was dated on August the 6th. So I was, I was circumnavigating the globe at that time. So we appreciate them. We are now going to begin looking this evening uh, at the three hours of darkness from noon to three o'clock in the afternoon when the Lord Jesus Christ hung on the cross of Calvary. If you recall, if, you, if it fits into your mind in a certain way, the Lord Jesus Christ 
celebrated the communion of the Lord's, Lord's Supper somewhere near where Lisa is sitting. If, if this is the Temple Mount of Jerusalem, and this is facing south, and this east is where the Mount of Olives is, I'm standing on the Temple Mount, and over here, it, back here is the Antonia Fortress, um, where the Roman soldiers so viciously brutalized the Lord Jesus Christ, and likely where his trials before Pilate were conducted. But over where Lisa is sitting is, is where archaeologists have a high level of confidence that they know the precise building, the upper room, uh, was located in where the Lord Jesus Christ is, exercised his, his, his right of requisition. Remember, when, when the, the king doesn't ask for anything, the king shouldn't ask for anything. The king exercises his right of requisition. He exercised his right of requisition the first time that we are aware of when he, when he told two of his men, go get that donkey colt and bring it to me. If anybody asks, what are you doing? You tell him this. So that he requisitioned that animal. And then his right of requisition was exercised when he, he didn't ask for the upper room. Okay. He requisitioned the upper room because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth of every mine. Uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ asks something in the, in the New Testament, it is always for the purpose of creating a teaching opportunity. He's, he never asks for permission. He never asks, would you do this for me? You know, none, none of that kind of, that, that's, just, that's just nonsense. Um, because he's the king, amen. So he was, he was here in the upper room. They celebrated the Passover. Uh, during the Passover, uh, he instituted the communion of the Lord's Supper. After that, John chapter 13, um, he began a, um, a monologue with his disciples as they began to walk toward the Mount of Olives. John chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, I am the true vine. I think he was probably right about here. And the two south main doors to the Temple Mount above them had a carving of a grapevine branches with grape clusters. Because there's reference in the Old Testament about the nation of Israel being his vine and his vineyard. And they failed again and again uh, down through history. And so as they're walking by, I believe, the, I believe that these guys were, as they did so frequently, they're always bragging about the temple and how beautiful it was and this and that. The Bible doesn't say that they were saying this, but I kind of think that's an unrecorded aspect of the conversation. Because <clears throat> they are always trying to focus his attention on the temple. And uh, I think he looked at, at that and they saw the, the wooden carving of the branches of the vine and uh, the clusters of grapes carved in. And then he turned to his men and said, I'm the true vine. We're not told what their immediate reaction was, but I think that's the context of what happened. Then John chapter 16, somewhere I believe, now I may be wrong, but it's not, it's not a hill I'm willing to die on. I think his high priestly intercessory prayer took place before he got to Gethsemane. That's just me. It's a majority opinion, but it's not the unanimous opinion. So he prayed John chapter 17. He gets to the, he gets to the, Garden of Gethsemane, which is on a shoulder of the Mount of Olives, which I've been to a bunch of times. You get a great view of, of the Temple Mount from there. And on the, on the north shoulder of the Mount of Olives was a, a fairly flat area, which was where there was an olive press, the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane was a big orchard of, and olive trees everywhere. And there's still some olive trees there that are almost certainly 2,000 years old. I mean, they're, they're old and ugly, so you know they're old. Uh, you get uglier as you get older, if you're all, an olive tree. Um, 
Did I save myself from that one? But anyway, he went up there and he separated from the eight, took the three with him. Then he separated from them and went off to pray and, and sweated, as it were, great drops of blood. God dispatched an angel and looked carefully for it. It was not the angel's job to comfort him. He was not comforted by that angel. He was sustained physically so that he could survive all the way to the cross. Okay. The Roman soldiers came. Judas Iscariot identified the Lord Jesus Christ. He had to do so because that's back in the day when there were no pictures. Okay, They didn't even have wanted posters back in the day. And so in order, to, in order to know who to arrest, they had to have somebody with them who actually knew the person. And Judas Iscariot was one of the people who actually knew what he looked like. So for 30 pieces of silver, he sold him out and he led the soldiers. And we know approximately how many soldiers, because of a particular Greek word that is used in John chapter 18, which refers to a unit of the uh, Roman military that when at full strength, Numbered a thousand. Spira, numbered a thousand. Now, most of the time they, they operated at half strength, but that would mean there were something in the vicinity of four to five hundred Roman soldiers were walking behind Judas Iscariot and maybe a dozen or so temple guards, along with a civilian from the from the high priest. And, and I think one other individual, okay, um, Malchus's, I think, cousin was with him. And so uh, they took the Lord Jesus Christ into custody. He then went through a series of illegal and unjust trials, uh, both before Annas, the old high priest, the former high priest, and the guy who really pulled the strings, and Caiaphas, his son-in-law, there was... There was in front of Annas, then in front of Caiaphas, and then the so-called legitimate trial in front of Caiaphas, except that he had tainted the jury pool. And, uh, and then he was brought in front of Pilate, and then, um, um, help me now. Give me the name, louder. Herod Antipas, yes and then back to Pilate again. So all of those trials, and then he was turned over to the execution squad that took him down the Via Della Rosa, out that way to where the hill called Golgotha, Mount Calvary was, and he was crucified. So what we're looking at now is the Lord Jesus Christ has been on the cross for something in the neighborhood of three hours. He was probably crucified around 9 o'clock in the morning. He has been hanging on the cross for about three hours. And so from noon on Crucifixion Friday until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the sun did not shine. Now let's read the passages that deal with that. Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 through 50 now from the sixth hour, now this is reckoning time from sunup, from sunup to noon is roughly six hours, so that's probably what's being referred to, right, rather than from midnight. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice. I mean, he let it rip. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, this man calleth for Elias. And I think the reason they said he called for Elias is they didn't understand the language, okay? And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar, and put it on a reed, and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. 
Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. <coughs> Notice, nobody killed him. No one took his life. Now turn, if you would please, to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. We're going to go through these four passages verse by verse. Mark chapter 15, beginning with verse 33. And when the sixth hour was come, there was a darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by, when they heard it, said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Now turn, please, to Luke chapter 23 and verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over, the, over all the earth until the ninth hour, and the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. Now I'll say more about this later, but, the, but what separated the holy place in the temple from the holy of holies was this veil. This veil was supposedly such of such thick weave and construction that supposedly a team of oxen could not tear it. And what's interesting is here we're told that it was it was torn. But notice what we see um, in John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. So it was torn, okay? John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. And why was it torn? Well, because there is now access to the Holy of Holies to more than one person one time a year. The Apostle Paul writes about it in Ephesians chapter 2. The veil was rent. Used to be, from the inauguration of the Mosaic Law era, only one person could go past that veil, and then only once a year. And it was such a dangerous thing that it is reported that the high priest had a rope tied around one of his ankles so that if he accidentally touched something in the pitch darkness of the Holy of Holies and God killed him, they would be able to drag the body out and it wouldn't be in the Holy of Holies for a year until the next time. <clears throat> so now, with the veil rent, that's the end of the Mosaic Law dispensation. That's the end. It's over. It's done. There is now access not just for one person who is of the tribe of Levi, of the, uh, of, of the household of Aaron, an Aaronic priest, to go in there one time a year for just a short time. But now anyone who is a believer in Christ has access to the Holy of Holies. I, I tend to think that the, the throne of grace in Hebrews is this Holy of Holies. And we have access to the Holy of Holies when we approach the throne of grace in prayer. So we have an opportunity to go someplace where for about 1,500 years, the earthly counterpart to that could only be visited by one man of one tribe, of one family, of one nation. And now we can go any time we want we who know Jesus Christ as our Savior. John chapter 19, verse 20. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So let us be careful to acknowledge we are on holy ground in this passage. 
more obviously, if not more truly, than the passages leading up to this time. The Lamb of God has put on him the sins of the world. He, he has been tried illicitly, illegally, unjustly, immorally, and been convicted without offense. He has been brutalized beyond comprehension. And he is now hanging on the tree as predicted by Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 23 more than a thousand years earlier, some 1,400 years earlier. It reads, His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accused of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Let me wrap up by reading to you something that the Puritan divine Matthew Henry wrote. Matthew Henry was a dissenter. He was a minister of the gospel in England. He was a pedo-baptist, which meant he baptized babies. Okay, So he was wrong about that. His view of the church is, is not one that I think is scriptural at all. But he was a godly man, and there is great benefit to resorting to him from time to time and reading what he had to say. And he wrote this about Matthew chapter 21 and verse 23. There is one reason here given which has reference to Christ. He that is hanged is a curse of God. That is, it is the highest degree of disgrace and reproach that can be done to a man and proclaims him under the curse of God as much as any external punishment can. Those that see him thus hang between heaven and earth will conclude him abandoned of both and unworthy of either. And therefore, let him not having all night, for that would carry it too far. Now the apostle, showing how Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by being himself made a curse for us, illustrates it by comparing the brand here put on him that was hanged on a tree with the death of Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Moses, by the Spirit, uses this phrase of being accursed of God when he means no more than being treated most ignominiously, that it might afterwards be applied to the death of Christ and might show that in it he underwent the curse of the law for us which is a great enhancement of his love and a great encouragement to our faith in him. And as the excellent Bishop Patrick well observes, this passage is applied to the death of Christ, not only because he bore our sins and was exposed to shame, as these malefactors were that were accursed of God, but because he was in the evening taken down from the cursed tree and buried, and that by the particular care of the Jews with an eye to this law, John chapter 19, verse 31, in token that now the guilt being removed, the law was satisfied as it was when the malefactor had hanged till sunset. It demanded no more. Then he ceased to be a curse, and those that were his. And as the land of Israel was pure and clean when the dead body was buried, so the church is washed and cleansed by the complete satisfaction which thus Christ made. The Lord Jesus Christ was accursed. And then when he suffered the wrath of God for the sins that were not his, he bore sins that were not his. Once God was satisfied that he has paid the sin penalty, he is no longer a curse. So let us carefully and cautiously and reverently consider the Savior fulfilling this portion of his office as the Lamb of God. Lord willing, we will take it up next week. I'm wondering if anyone has a question on what we've dealt with so far, the passages that we've read, a question, a curiosity that you hope I will deal with and you want to make sure I do. Anything at all along that line from anybody? Okay. Can you tell me what's what's wrong with being hung on a tree?
that someone would say that you are cursed for hanging on a tree? Have you ever thought about it? Why is a guy who's hanging on a tree cursed? Well, first of all, he's not going to get off that tree alive. That's number one. Once you're hung up there, you're up there until you're dead. And sometimes, some people, a week, 10 days, up there dying, slowly, gradually. Okay. Secondly, you're up there naked. Excuse me, this is not Venice Beach. Okay. They didn't prize themselves on how little clothing they could wear and be okay with everybody. No. Uh, the Jewish people were a modest people, and somebody that was stripped absolutely and stark naked and nailed to a cross, uh, he is being absolutely humiliated in front of everybody. And Mount Calvary was in a portion of, if this is Antonia Fortress, Mount Calvary was over in this area, just outside the Damascus Gate. The Damascus Gate was one of the gates uh, where if, if you're going to the city of Damascus, which is the next big city to the, to the northwest, you had to leave, enter and leave coming from Damascus, going to the Damascus Gate. So everybody that was in transit, everybody, everybody, think, think of... Think of the 605 freeway. Think of the, think of the 405 freeway. And you're hung up in front of everyone. And you're, you're up there. You've been accused of wrongdoing. You've been found guilty of wrongdoing. You, you're crucified, and you're going to be there until you're dead. And your family is held up to public ridicule and shame, everyone that's associated with you. So, yeah, accursed. That, that, that's why, okay? Uh, anybody that was hung on a cross is, is accursed. Uh, not just the Lord Jesus Christ, but the two thieves also. Nobody has a question? Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. We ask that you might bless this message, that you might speak to our hearts, that you might help us to prepare ourselves for a blessing. Help us to learn more about the sacrifice of our Savior on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And for that, we will thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me... Uh